Welcome to chapter four, which is all going to be on cell structure and function. So the parts of cells and um, what those parts are used for in the cell. There's going to be lots of new vocabulary, sort of like always. Um, so please feel free to use the Quizlets and the study guide as you're going through. And then know that there's also some extra resource videos for you um, so that you are able to go through this information in a few different ways. So studying is a little bit easier. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, what are we going to look at today? We're going to look at how cells are organized. We're going to first look at prokaryotic cells. Those are going to be cells that don't have a nucleus and don't have membrane bound organelles. Then we're going to look at eukaryotic cells and specifically looking at nucleus and ribosomes, the endomembrane system, which is like a fancy way to say Golgi apparatus and endoplasmic reticulum. Then we're going to look at some smaller organelles that are maybe not present in every cell and vacuoles and then things like the mitochondria and chloroplasts, and finally the cytoskeleton. So we first look at cells starting in the early 1800s. We really discover or make microscopes, and one of the first things that we see are cells under them. And there is this unifying concept in biology that living things at their most basic unit are made of cells. And there are some works by Schleiden and Schwann in those 1830s that contribute to something that we call the cell theory. Um, and if you're really interested in these two characters, I recommend looking at the extra resources in the uh, D2L. But Ultimately, it's not as straightforward uh, when we're creating this as one might think, but together we come up with the cell theory. It is that all organisms are composed of cells. That was first sort of seen by um, a German botanist, so studying plants, Matthias Schleiden, and then a German zoologist, Theodore Schwann. So Schwann and Schleiden together around the same time are looking at plants and animal cells and seeing that all of the different plants and animals are made of cells. Cells are only able to come from pre-existing cells because cells are self-reproducing. There was for a while an idea that cells just were kind of poof out of nowhere and then more cells poof out of nowhere, but we figure out from a German physician, uh, Rudolf Virchow, that cells come from pre-existing cells and that cells are the basic unit uh, of structure and function in organisms. So again, the parts of the cell theory are that all organisms are made of cells. Cells come from already existing cells by self -re reproducing or pre production, and that cells are the basic unit and structure of organisms. With that, this picture here is just to show you that um, there are plant cells and that there are animal cells, but again, our living things have come from cells. That's their basic unit. Um, and that even with plants and animals, we do see some organization um, within these cells, parts and pieces that are the same. We'll first look at our more simple types of cells. Those are going to be our prokaryotic cells. Those are going to lack membrane bound organelles and lack a nucleus. And they are really structurally tinier and more simple than eukaryotic cells that have a nucleus and have membrane bound organelles. What types of things are made of prokaryotic cells? Really, it's bacteria. Some bacteria cause diseases, but they are also decomposers. They can be used to manufacture medications and drugs. 
and then archaea. They can live in extreme habitats. And these two prokaryotic domains do have a lot of similarities uh, in how their cells are arranged because they're both prokaryotes, but they do have a slightly different way of doing metabolism and biochemically have different um, components in their cell membranes. So they are considered two domains, two separate things. They used to all be characterized in one domain, domain prokaryotes. Um, but in the 70s, it was discovered they should be separated, and they were. If we look at the structure of prokaryotic cells, they're very, very tiny. They're usually about 1 to 1.5 micrometer wide and 2 to 6 micrometers long. They do occur in three basic shapes. This sort of round spherical shape is called a coccus. If you have ever had a bacterial infection and the doctor said like you had streptococcus, it meant that you had strep throat with those little spherical shaped bacteria. Then there is bacillus. Bacillus is sort of a rod shaped or like a Tic Tac or Mike and Ike shaped. And then spirillium is a spiral. We also call it spirochete if that spirillium is more flexible, like a bendable type of a outside um, shape. So we've got spherical, which are round, bacillus, which are rod or like tic-tac shaped, and spirillium and spirochete, which are like spirals. Our cell envelope is going to be this outer layer of our prokaryotic cells that will include the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is made up of lipids in two layers or a lipid bilayer, which has embedded and attached outside proteins. Um, these plasma membranes can form these little pouches. We call them mesosomes, which will increase surface area on the prokaryotic cell. They also have a cell wall, which maintains the cell shape and the cell strength. Um, and it can have a sugar protein component in it called peptidoglycan. And then there is something called the glycocalyx, which is a sugary layer outside of the cell wall. Um, this is really a protective layer. It helps for the bacteria to stick to itself and stick to the surface, as well as makes it much more resistant um, to damage from something like antibiotics or from touch and stress to it. Here are just our shapes of our bacteria. If you've got these little circles, that's your caucus, singular cocci, um, spirillium, that spiral shape, if it's kind of rigid, held in place that way, spirillium, if it's able to be more um, fluid, it's spirochete, but it still means a spiral spring type shape. And then bacillus, this rod or sort of tic-tac type shaped. Here's our plasma membrane. So we've got our phospholipid bilayer, and then we will have protein molecules either embedded into the membrane or able to hang out um, on top or on the internal side, just sort of resting, um, not fully embedded into the membrane. If we then look at a prokaryotic cell model here, a drawing, we can see um, that we are going to have that outside glycocalyx on some of our uh, bacteria. So it's that capsule glycocalyx part. It's the outermost layer. Then we will have this um, cell wall cell wall made with peptidoglycan for strength, uh, and then lipids, that phospholipid bilayer. Then we will have our um, plasma membrane. Sorry, I spoke too quick. That's our phospholipid bilayer is our plasma membrane. 
And then inside we will have a nucleoid region. That's where our DNA is. Usually it's one single circular DNA. Um, you could also have some plasmids, which are just little chunks of DNA for um, adverse conditions. It may have some DNA that could help the bacteria survive. And then we will see that there are ribosomes that act as the site of protein synthesis. Some other things that you may or may not see depending on the bacteria, you may see these little hairs called fimbrae. They're like little bristles or hairs to help it attach. Um, we can also find pili, which is a type of fimbrae, which will help for um, reproduction. And then you may see a flagellum, which is going to rotate um, and help to push the bacteria forward. If we look then inside um, a little bit more, we'll see that there is cytoplasm. This is this goopy jelly-like substance, semi-fluid solution that is going to be inside encased by that plasma membrane. It's going to contain water, inorganic, and organic molecules, and enzymes. We will see the nucleoid region that's going to contain our single circular DNA. And we will see the plasmids. These are these small extra rings of DNA. Um, and then we also see that there are ribosomes, which are these tiny structures that will synthesize proteins. And then again, externally, you may have flagella that is going to be for movement, fimbrae, which could be these small bristle-like hairs or fibers on the surface, and then that conjugation pili, which is going to be um, this tube-like structure that DNA can pass through during conjugation or reproduction. If we then go on to our more complicated cell types, our eukaryotic cells, we'll see that there is still going to be some of those same things, but now we will have much more organization. So our eukaryotic cells are going to contain a membrane-bound nucleus that has DNA. It's going to have specialized organelles to do jobs and functions in the cell. It has a plasma membrane, which is going to separate the cell contents from the environment and regulate the passage of things in and out of the cell. It is also composed of a phospholipid bilayer and has embedded and peripheral proteins as well. Really, the first two categories in this plasma membrane are what, um, or the first two um, dots here, um, before plasma membrane are what is going to make eukaryotic cells different from the prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells also tend to be much larger than prokaryotic cells. Our eukaryotic cells are going to have compartments. They're going to have spaces dedicated for certain functions. We call those compartments organelles. And again, they are going to isolate reactions from other reactions and do specific jobs. How did we get organelles? Um, we really think there's two things that happened. First, that as prokaryotic cells got bigger and bigger, uh, their membranes started to bend and fold, and they bent and fold inwards, which then allowed um, for an endomembrane system, an inside membrane. As that inside membrane system happened, um, it increased surface area, so it allowed transportation to be better in the cell. It allowed for chemical reactions to happen away from other chemical reactions that would stop it or speed it up too quickly. So it made the cell more efficient, and over time it kept that inside bended folded membrane. Then there's also this process in which small bacteria that could do photosynthesis and that could make energy, make ATP, um, got taken up into the cell. Um, and so first that was with mitochondria, they got absorbed 
um, by a bigger, now what we would call a eukaryotic cell over time. They worked together so much in making ATP that they just couldn't live without each other anymore. And now we have mitochondria. Um, and then later, a cyanobacteria um, that could do photosynthesis gets taken up. And now over time, those have stayed. Um, and now we have chloroplasts. With our animal cells, this is a horrible slide. We're going to go through these parts and pieces, um, but it shows you a lot of the things that are organized in our cell. So we see our big nucleus with our nucleolus, nuclear envelope with these pores. We see this blue structure zigzaggy back and forth. That's our endoplasmic reticulum. Some of that endoplasmic reticulum is going to have ribosomes attached to it. So we call it rough endoplasmic reticulum. Some does not, so we call it smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We'll then see this little squished bit over here. That's our Golgi apparatus, or you may have heard Golgi bodies to help move and transport things in and out of the cell. We've got our mitochondria, which are these big jelly bean looking things. We have lysosomes um, here to break down um, components that are no longer working in the cell. We also could have peroxisomes to detox and break things down. Um, we have our cytoskeleton um, inside. That's this sort of network of strands you're seeing. And then our outside plasma membrane. So again, this is just sort of a really brief overview. It comes from your textbook. Um, but don't worry, we're going to go through all of these parts and pieces. Same thing with a plant cell. You'll see um, this in your textbook as well. And it has a lot of the same stuff like a nucleus, nucleolus, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi bodies, mitochondria. But then you'll also see it has something called a vacuole, which is this big storage place for water um, in the cell. And then you'll also see these green things, these chloroplasts that have pigments to catch sunlight so a plant cell can make its own food. And again, we're not going to spend a ton of time on these pictures because we'll look at these things as we're going through our next bit of slides. So when we look at plant and animal, animal cell diagrams, we're looking at a very generalized drawing. So while these pictures that you just saw have everything in them, they are generalized. Specialized cells doing specialized jobs for the plant or animal may have less or more or different organelles depending on what they do. For example, liver cells that detoxify drugs have a lot more smooth endoplasmic reticulum when compared to other body cells. Or your nerve cells that carry electrical impulses have a bigger or more plasma membrane. So when we are looking at our diagram, know that that is our specialized or our not specialized. It is our generalized version of the cell and more specialized cells could look different. The cell is a system of interconnected organelles that all work together. You can sort of think of it like your body has organs that work together to make you do the things you do. Uh, one example, of course, our nucleus is going to be the place that holds genetic material. It communicates with ribosomes in the cytoplasm. So they have to work together in order for the cell to function. There are going to be the production of specific molecules that will take place in organelles or in the membranes. This is going to be done by enzymes. And if we remember from um, our last lecture or two lectures ago, enzymes are not used up in a reaction. Enzymes are just making reactions happen faster. 
Anything that gets made is called a product and it is transported around the cell by vesicles. Vesicles are just these little sacs of the membrane material that are holding on to things that need to move around the cell. Vesicles move around using the cytoskeleton and the cytoskeleton, you can think of them as different size protein fibers that sort of act like railroad tracks around the cell. And when we look at plant cells, fungus, and protocells, a lot of them have cell walls that e either have cellulose um, or other structural sugars in them. Um, and that is there to protect the membrane. Let's start looking at some of these organelles specifically. We'll start with our nucleus. The nucleus is the control or command center of the cell, especially in our drawings. It's usually right in the center, um, but you can even see this if you look at cells under the microscope, it's usually in the middle of the cell. It gets separated from the cytoplasm by something called the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope is a double layer membrane and there are nuclear pores that exchange uh, nucleoplasm, that's the cytoplasm that is in the nucleus, and cytoplasm, which is the goopy stuff in the cell. So those pores allow things to move in and out. Inside the nucleus, we have chromatin in that nucleoplasm. Chromatin is made up of nucleic acids and proteins. When chromatin condenses, it makes chromosomes. So you can think of chromatin like a bowl of ramen noodles. And then when our cell wants to make a copy of itself, it will condense. Think of it as the ramen noodles before you put it in the hot water. Uh, so again, chromosomes are gonna form during cell division. And on that chromosome is where we have genetic information. Within the nucleus, there's this darker part. Think of it like a little marble inside of the nucleus. That is going to be made up of something called ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA has the main job to make ribosomes. So that inner darker part of your nucleus is called the nucleolus. Then you have your nucleus all surrounded by the nuclear envelope that has nuclear pores in it. So again, if we look here at our nucleus, we've got this little dot here, that's your nucleolus making ribosomes. Then you've got your whole nucleus here. This part here is where you're going to find your chromatin that will condense into chromosomes held together by that nuclear envelope that has these pores that allow things in and out of the cell nucleus. Then there are ribosomes. Ribosomes can be uh, located on the endoplasmic reticulum, therefore making it rough endoplasmic reticulum, or they could be free floating in the cytoplasm either alone, a little single ribosome, or in groups, those groups we call polyribosomes. Ribosomes are the place where there is the protein synthesis happening, or we're making proteins. We make proteins through a process called transcription and translation. Transcription is just like what the word transcribe means to write down, to copy. So information from the DNA is copied, transcription, to messenger RNA, and then that is put out into the cell cytoplasm. A ribosome gets a messenger RNA and it translates it, or it makes it into, instead of genetic language, protein language. So our messenger RNA comes to a ribosome and then we are going to translate it into a sequence of amino acids. Then that protein is synthesized uh, and made. If it's made in the cytoplasmic ribosomes, it stays in the cytoplasm. 
if it is in a ribosome that is in the endoplasmic reticulum, it is going to stay in that endoplasmic reticulum. So here is how that's happening. You've got your chromatin that will turn into chromosomes in the nucleus. That's going to be where your DNA is. We have a messenger RNA that is being made. That messenger RNA will go out and find a ribosome in the cytoplasm. That messenger RNA is then translated and made into this chain of a protein with amino acids. Then it is either going to stay out here uh, in our cytoplasm or that protein can be in the endoplasmic reticulum to be finished before being brought to where it needs to be in the cell. Next, we're going to look at the endomembrane system, which is just going to be a bunch of compartments inside of the cell made up of membranes. This is going to help restrict enzymatic reactions to a certain part of the cell. It does consist of the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, and vesicles. And there's many different kinds of vesicles. Some transport materials between organelles, some between the outside world and the cell, and vice versa. We'll start with the endoplasmic reticulum. It's just this group of membrane channels and flattened sacs that are continuous with the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. So that is that whole thought that eventually we got eukaryotic cells because of the bending and folding of the plasma membrane. Well, there you are. This is how we know that that is probably true. Um, we have our rough ER, which has these ribosomes embedded into it. This is where we are making proteins, or we call it anabolism. Anabolism is building up, and so we're building up proteins. We can modify proteins. Sometimes we add a sugar part to them, and we make glycoproteins, which are very important in identifying cells and, and other cell functions. Some of these are going to be transport vesicles. Um, so there'll be parts of the rough ER that will then sort of bud off and head to the Golgi apparatus. So that will transport these proteins. The smooth ER is sort of connected after the rough ER. There are no rib ribosomes there, but it does help to make lipids um, in the testes, testosterone is made by the smooth ER, if you just want an example. It is also um, a various job location. Sometimes it will build things like lipids. Sometimes it detoxifies, like breaks down drugs in your liver. Um, that happens in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And sometimes it's a storage place, just holding on to extra molecules for a bit. It also will form transport vesicles so that substances can move to the Golgi apparatus. So here, again, that's your nucleus with its nuclear envelope. Right next to it is this system of the endoplasmic reticulum. So first we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum studded with these ribosomes for making and finishing up proteins. And then you have um, right after that, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum where there are no ribosomes really for making lipids and detoxifying. Next is the Golgi apparatus named after Camillo Golgi. Um, this is going to be these flattened, almost bended or curved sacs that sort of resemble a stack of hollow pancakes. These are there to get 
proteins and lipids and modify them with signal sequences or signaling proteins or sugars. They add on and finish up these proteins and lipids. They will get vesicles from the endoplasmic reticula reticulum on the inner face of it. Um, in chemistry, we use the word cis face. That means the inside face. Uh, after modifying it, it will prepare those proteins and lipids as little shipments or packages in vesicles that will leave the Golgi from the trans or the outer face of the Golgi apparatus. Um, some of these vesicles will transport to different locations in the cell. Some will be exported from the cell. We call that secretion and exocytosis. Others get returned to the endoplasmic reticulum or merge with the plasma membrane. It just depends on what the protein or fat that is in the Golgi apparatus is for, what its function is destined to be. But here's what it looks like. We've got our nucleus, our rough endoplasmic reticulum, our smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Again, both of these are making vesicles that transport to this Golgi apparatus where they're finished. They are packaged up into vesicles that could then lead to outside the cell or could go to other parts of the cell. Some other sort of accessory things we have here, of course, we've got lysosomes. Lysosomes are membrane bound vesicles, but they're not found in plants. This is an animal cell only thing. They are made by the Golgi apparatus and they have digestive enzymes that are very acidic. So they can break large molecules like a large protein into simpler subunits like amino acids. This is there to recycle things in the cell. So we can think of lysosomes like the recycling plants. In a white blood cell, lysosomes have a very special job of engulfing pathogens or the things that cause disease. There are some lysosomal storage diseases that can happen for people. Um, it is because of a defect in that lysosomal enzyme and it can cause something called Tay-Sachs disease. And there is gene therapy available to help fix the, the genetic component that coded for these defect enzymes in the lysosomes and it restores the enzymes to the cells. Here's a lysosome up close. Again, it's just this membrane bound vesicle. Um, that is going to contain um, acidic decomposer digi or digesting enzymes to break down cell parts. In summary, proteins are made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Lipids are in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Both are carried by vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus makes um, the final finishing touches and then it sorts and packages them into vesicles that can go around the cell or out of the cell. These secretory vesicles carry products to the membrane and then it makes secretions. Example, mammary glands make milk um, and the pancreas makes digestive enzymes and then they're pushed out of those cells, secreted out of those cells. Lysosomes fuse with incoming vesicles and they can digest big molecules into their subunits as a recycling center for the cell. As a whole, we start here in our nucleus with that nuclear envelope. We have our endoplasmic reticulum, uh, rough then smooth. Again, these vesicles are going to the Golgi bodies, which are then finishing them, packaging them to be out of the cell or things coming in can come into vesicles that will then head either to our Golgi or could be broken down by lysosomes. 
There's also vacuoles. Um, and with that, there's a special kind of a vacuole called a peroxisome. They're like lysosomes, but we know that lysosomes aren't found in plants. So peroxisomes are found in plants, but can also be found in animals. Um, these are similar to lysosomes in that they are a membrane-bound vesicle. They have enzymes, but they lack this peroxisomal uh, membrane or this like peroxide layer. Um, and so it can have this neurological damage component to it. Um, that being said, it is going to actively um, make and destroy lipids. And it is going to make hydrogen peroxide, which is why it gets the name peroxisome. Um, of course, peroxide is a toxic substance to cells. So it gets broken down into water and oxygen by an enzyme called catalase, which you will see in your lab. Um, so these plants, they have this peroxisome. Animal cells could have it. But instead of fusing, really, it is making peroxide to break down the lipids that are coming to it. Um, and then in a plant cell, we have vacuoles, which are these really big sacs that are larger than vesicles. They store material that is in excess for plants that's usually water. There are some specialized type of vacuoles um, called contractile vacuoles that will squish water out of single cell protists for the most part. In general, when we talk of vacuoles, it's really for plants. They have this central vacuole. It's going to make up to 90% of the volume of some cells. It will store water. It can store nutrients. It can store pigment. It can store waste. In order to maintain turgor pressure, um, more water will be put in to that vacuole. Toxic substances uh, that are in a plant that get used to protect it from being eaten by herbivores can also be stored in those vacuoles. And then some functions formed by lysosomes could happen in these vacuoles. So organelle parts are broken down in vacuoles sometimes. Again, you can think of it like this big, large water balloon inside of a plant cell. We are going to see sort of next, why is it storing this? Well, it's storing this in this central vacuole because sunlight is shining down on chloroplasts, which are capturing that energy to make sugar, which then that goes to the mitochondria to be broken down to make energy um, to continue this whole process. So we are storing um, some of these components within that central vacuole. And then also knowing that these organelles, chloroplast and mitochondria, are sort of what we're going to talk about next. So again, chloroplasts are going to be found mostly in plants. They are this double bound membrane organelle. The inside membrane is folded to increase surface area. And it forms these little disc-like structures when it's folded called thylakoids, which are then stacked together. Think of them like a stack of checker chips into something called grana. And then all of those thylakoids and grana are suspended in a semi-fluid structure called stroma. Chloroplasts are green because they have chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a green photosynthetic pigment that's only going to be in the inner membranes of the chloroplast, but its main job is going to be to capture sunlight energy.
Chloroplasts are a type of plastid. So that is where you see plast from. Um, and really it's just this membrane organelle that is called a plastid that serves as a site for photosynthesis. We already know that it's going to capture energy to make sugar and to drive other cellular machinery, other parts of the cell. In photosynthesis, we are going to make carbohydrates from carbon dioxide and water. That is going to then be this food source um, for the plant. So it's making its food from carbon that is coming from carbon dioxide. Then energy compounds are made into higher energy compounds um, through the process of photosynthesis. And really we get this ultimate equation here where you have solar energy plus carbon dioxide plus water makes a carbohydrate plus oxygen. Chlorophyll is in the thylakoid membranes. The enzyme that makes the carbohydrates are in the fluid part, the stroma. And then only plants, algae, and some bacteria can do photosynthesis. How did we even get these chloroplasts? We said earlier that they were engulfed. Um, so that is something called endosymbiotic theory, saying that an eukaryotic cell engulfed a photosynthetic bacteria and then over time they developed together and then it was stuck and it became the chloroplast. So if we look at our chloroplast we'll see these little individual membrane structures that's our um, thylakoid membrane all stacked together like checker chips that is going to be the grana. This is where we are finding the chlorophyll to capture the sunlight energy. Holding them all in space here is the stroma, that fluid part. And of course, we need water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight. And the main job is to create glucose, a sugar, a carbohydrate that acts as the food for the plant. We also have mitochondria that's going to be found in plants and animals. Uh, so it's going to be found in nearly all plant, algae, and animal cells. Mitochondria are smaller than the chloroplasts and the number of them vary depending on what that type of cell does for the body. So something like a liver cell can have a thousand mitochondria. Muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria, but other cells in your body have less um, if they are not as active of a cell. Um, mitochondria have their own DNA and their own ribosomes. This is one thing that supports that endosymbiotic theory that it was an engulfed um, bacteria cell. Mitochondria also have a double membrane. Their inner folded membrane um, is going to be called cristae and it will have this goopy stuff around it called the matrix. And the matrix is going to be just like that stroma. It's going to be the part that has enzymes. But for mitochondria, the enzymes aren't to make sugar these enzymes are to break down sugar. Um, so we say that they are the uh, cell respiratory enzymes. Mitochondria are the site for cellular respiration. Oxygen um, is used and carbon dioxide is given off. And this is going to make ATP the energy source for the cell. So mitochondria, you may have heard, is the powerhouse of the cell because it's making ATP. So here's that mitochondria, it's sort of like a jelly bean shaped to membrane. The inside bends and folds, that's the cristae, and then the goopy stuff is the matrix. 
Last but not least is our cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton's main job is to maintain cell shape. It assists in the movement of cells and organelles, and it makes internal transport possible. So stuff moving around the cells couldn't happen without a cytoskeleton. There are three main types of macromolecule fibers. They're made up of proteins, mostly for our cytoskeleton. That is actin filaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. These are assembled and put back together as they are needed. They may be compared to the bones and muscles of an animal, if that is helpful for you to think of. I also just like to think of them sort of as this railroad track that is being built um, in the cell. The cytoskeleton is dynamic or changing, meaning that it can respond to environmental changes. First up is our actin filaments. These are really thin filaments. I like to just think of the T and actin and T and thin. Uh, and they are sort of twisted like a pearl on a necklace. They do make up this very dense web right under the plasma membrane to help keep the cell shape. They are also the anchor support for microvilli, um, these little projections of the plasma membrane, like in your intestinal cells. Um, they are also sort of the traffic cops for intracellular activity. So for stuff moving around the cell, they're the ones that are regulating that. Um, when we look at amoebas, they can squish out some of their cytoplasm and make like little arms or little feet. Uh, so we call that cytoplasmic streaming and they make those pseudopods, those false feet, false arms. They are also very important in muscle contraction. There's actin and myosin in your muscle cells that slide past each other. Um, so actin and myosin are these motor molecules. And actin is very important in cell division where two cells form from one cell. So here is just an example of this actin myosin. So we see these little strands of twisted pearls. Uh, that's your actin, it's very thin. Myosin, we call it a thick filament. It is like these little arms that grip onto the pearls. It requires energy, but they swish that little arm uh, and that slides the actin over the myosin and that makes a contraction of muscle. Next is intermediate filaments. They're the in-between size. They're not actin filaments super thin and they're not microtubules, which are bigger. They're in between. They sort of have this rope-like structure of protein. It does vary in nature and from tissue to tissue exactly the arrangement. Um, but some of their functions are to support the nuclear envelope connect cells to other cells. We call that cell-cell junctions, like holding skin cells tightly together. Um, the protein keratin, which you find in your hair um, and your nails and your skin, is what is going to provide strength. Then microtubules are these hollow cylinders. I like to think of them sort of like twizzlers um, in a cell that are made up of two types of proteins called alpha and beta tubulin. There is this random spontaneous pairing of alpha and beta tubulin to make something called a dimer. Di means two. Uh, and then these dimers arrange themselves into spiral tubules. And there are 13 dimers that go around. Again, a fancy way to just say that these are like a Twizzler. There are all these little parts and pieces that come together to make this big structure of a tube. Um, there is a microtubule organizing center and the most important one is called a centrosome. It's important for organizing our um, genetic material, our chromosomes when cells divide. 
our microtubules are going to interact with motor molecules that act in myosin, as well as something called kinesin and dyin, which cause movements. Um, and then with that microtubule organizing center, that centrosome um, is important for making our mitotic spindle, which it tells chromosomes where to go. So here's that fancy microtubule. Again, I kind of think of it like Twizzlers. We have your dimer here, your two um, types of um, tubulin coming together to make this tube. And then, of course, you have these different proteins here that are allowing for movement across this microtubule. We said, again, that the arrangement, oh, what is happening? The arrangement is varied based on the protein and based on the structure it's in. So um, just knowing that it's arranged as this big tube it is plenty. Um, but we have, again, this actin. Um, we have intermediate filaments. And then we have microtubules. Specifically, cendrioles are these short, hollow cylinders. I kind of think of them like um, rigatoni spaghetti noodles, uh, like the, the little short cylinders. They're made of 27 different microtubules that overlap in triplet pairs. You have one pair per animal cell, and it is only in animal cells that we find these centrioles. They are going to be at little right angles to each other, and they'll separate during cell division, and it will help to organize those chromosomes. Centrioles could also be present um, where we have cilia and flagella to act as an anchoring system. So here's our little centrioles, uh, and they're at right angles, and then they will move across the cell when it's time to divide, and then that way it helps to organize where the chromosomes go. Cilia and flagella are just these hair-like or tail-like projections that are off of the surface of the cell to help in movement. Um, this is different than our prokaryotic flagella. Our prokaryotic flagella, we said, spins around. Our eukaryotic flagella sort of flaps like it swims. Um, also, we'll see that the outer covering of our flagella is plasma membrane. That's not the case in prokaryotic cells. Um, inside, we have a little cylinder holding it in place, sort of a modified centriole. Um, and this sort of nine plus two pattern is used for all cilia and flagella, even our prokaryotics. Uh, and then in eukaryotes, cilia are shorter, hair-like. You can think of them sort of like words that move in coordinated waves, um, which is going to be like cells in your respiratory tract that move mucus. Um, and flagella, of course, move like a propeller um, or like a corkscrew like the swimming motion for sperm cells. So here's that structure. You've got this internal microtubule, almost central arrangement. Then outside, you have it uh, covered in that plasma membrane. And again, it's like this tail-like structure. All right, so that's all our parts and pieces. Again, there are resources on the D2L for you. But of course, if you have any questions, feel free to look through the study guide, look through the PowerPoint, look through this appendix of just the pictures I showed you in case my descriptions weren't enough. Um, and then of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.